As we established in part one, Christ is a union of opposite elements. This is what confers his status as a divine being. We have also established since the beginning of this series that in order for certain things to exist, like light, there must be an opposite element to give it dimension, like darkness. Based on these two maxims and everything else discussed in part one, the logical conclusion is that there must be an opposite for Christ, namely, the Antichrist. Every spirit that dissolveth Jesus is Antichrist, of whom you have heard that he cometh. To the atheistic members of our audience, the notion of an Antichrist induces an eye roll. But remember what I said at the end of part one. For the time being, ignore Christ and the Antichrist as supernatural beings and focus on them merely as symbols. If opposites are a precondition to existence, and the past two millennia have been defined by worship of Christ, at least in the Western world, is it irrational to deduce that there will inevitably be an opposite to the self, an opposite symbol that will be worshipped? Now, as for what form that symbol might take, at the beginning of chapter 5, Jung links the advent of the Antichrist with the development of science and technology in the last few centuries. Note that this isn't a condemnation of science and technology, by the way. It is self-evident that science and technology have produced wonders for our civilization. However, despite this positive element, there has to also be a negative element, an opposite element. Namely, that science and technology have demonstrated a capacity to challenge religious doctrine. While some secularists and atheists might deem this dissolving of religion as a triumph, there are others that foresaw what would happen when the moral systems that sustained Western civilization, for better and for worse, came crashing down. One such person was Friedrich Nietzsche. Some mistake his famous proclamation of God being dead as being positive, but to quote Jordan Peterson, Nietzsche thought all hell would break loose on account of God's death. Like I just said, even though there is a positive element to science and technology, like with everything, there is also a negative element. The negative element, according to Jung, was that it doesn't necessarily offer a coherent moral system. Now, some might argue that it could, and that's fine, but that argument is not the focus of this series, and that would take up too much time. Anyways, given the fact that science and technology had so effectively challenged religious doctrine from the end of the 18th century to the end of the 19th century, the loss of religion would be the inevitable outcome, that loss of a higher state to aspire to. There is a problem here, because if people lose the symbol that they have tried to emulate for thousands of years, the symbol their culture was predicated on, that would have drastic psychological consequences. In the mind of Nietzsche, as well as Jung, there would be two consequences to the loss of that symbol of the self. One, the advent of nihilism, and two, the advent of totalitarianism. The former denotes a worship of nothing, and the latter denotes a worship of the state. As we saw in the 20th century, worship of the state in regards to Nazi Germany, the Soviet Union, Maoist China, Pol Pot's Cambodia, and many others resulted in hundreds of millions of painful deaths. If that doesn't sound like a good alternative, nihilism isn't much better. The notion that life is meaningless can make the suffering inherent to life become unbearable. The consequence of this for a large number of people will be stagnation, or in the worst cases, suicide. To Jung, the anti-Christian sentiment symbolized by science and technology had its benefit, but also has its deficit. In regards to Christianity, or religion more broadly, the purported benefit is that it can civilize and give purpose to legions of people. However, it also has its deficit because it will sometimes ignore the truths and benefits of science in order to maintain the integrity of the religion. Jung felt that the only way that either side could control and heal their respective negative elements is if they recognize the existence of the other side, the benefits and deficits that they bring, and integrate them. In other words, by bringing the unconscious repressed elements into consciousness and confronting them, they will develop to a higher state of being.
Now, whether or not this is a legitimate way of looking at things is not the purpose of this video. As I said from the beginning, I am not here to pass judgment. I am only trying to present what Jung is saying in a coherent way. Emphasis on the word trying. If you want to discuss the legitimacy of Jung's view, that is what the comment section is there for. With that being said, I will continue summarizing the remainder of this chapter. So far, Jung has demonstrated that he is not afraid to find utility with the symbol of Christ, but he is also not afraid to criticize the broader religion. In fact, a major component of this chapter is Jung's highlighting of a negative Christian tendency. Now what do I mean by this? Well, in certain religious circles, the Christian God is conceptualized as the summum bonum, an entity that is only good, without any negative element. All that comes from God is good, and anything that can be considered evil is merely the absence of good. Evil in itself supposedly has no existence. Now, the notion that evil in itself has no existence or substance is a doctrine defined by Jung as the privatio boni. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Many religious scholars have upheld this doctrine, and Jung goes on to list them in this chapter. Number one, Basil the Great was a highly influential theologian in the 4th century. He is viewed as a saint in the traditions of both Eastern and Western Christianity. He believed that God does not author evil, and that evil is merely the privation of good. Number two, Dionysius of the first century is also venerated as a saint in the Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches, being the first bishop of Athens. Three, the aforementioned Saint Augustine from the last video states the following in the Liber Sententiarum ex Augustino. Evil is not a substance, for as it has not God for its author, it does not exist. And so the defect of corruption is nothing else than the desire or act of a misdirected will. The Privatio Boni doctrine denies the necessity of opposites. Naturally, Jung took issue with this because the foundations of religious morality are predicated on the existence of both good and evil as equal opposites. One cannot exist without the other. Yet the Bravadio Boni doctrine not only denies evil its existence, but that it can come from God. There are many criticisms that Jung lists in this chapter, but for the sake of time, I'll only cite a few. He concedes that evil can be represented as the absence of good, but with this kind of logic, one could just as well say the temperature of the Arctic winter, which freezes our noses and ears, is relatively speaking only a little below the heat prevailing at the equator. He also offers more serious arguments. Quote, One could hardly call the things that have happened and still happen in the concentration camps of the dictator states an accidental lack of perfection. It would sound like mockery. Jung does not only use rational deduction and psychological experience to criticize the Privatio Boni doctrine, but even cites the Bible to prove his point. Granted, he already did this when he cited Paul in Romans, but he drives the point home when he observes the God of the Old Testament. To Jung, the God of the Old Testament is incommensurate with the Christian conception of God as the summum bonum. In fact, it seems that Jung favors the Jewish conception of God in Yahweh, where he is not just the sum of all that is good, but also of evil. We see the wrathful side of God many times in the Old Testament. In the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, in the story of Job, in the story of Noah. But for the purposes of this discussion, we will focus on God's wrath in Egypt. In the book of Exodus, Moses attempts to free the Hebrews from Egyptian slavery. When the Pharaoh refuses to do this, God sends many plagues on the land of Egypt in order to get Pharaoh to change his mind. The last of these plagues was the killing of the firstborn sons by Yahweh. There was a way for people in Egypt at this time to prevent their firstborn sons from dying at the hands of Yahweh, and that involved painting their doors with lamb's blood. When studying this part of the story, Jung reached out to a rabbinical scholar named Zwei Wroblowski, who put together a number of passages from Hebrew literature. He wanted to understand why the people of Egypt had to paint their doors with lamb's blood. Quote, our Joseph taught, What is the meaning of the verse? And none of you shall go out the door of his house until the morning. Once permission has been granted to the destroyer, he does not distinguish between the righteous and the wicked. 
Indeed, he even begins with the righteous. This depiction of God, or Yahweh, as an unconscious destroyer, whose wrath is synonymous with the indiscriminate destruction of a tornado, doesn't seem commensurate with the Christian conception of God as pure good. This is one of many reasons why Jung advocates for the Yahwehistic conception of God rather than the summum bonum conception. Every aspect of this discussion comes down to Jung's tendency to view all of the universe in pairs of opposites. He believes that the only way a person can develop is by viewing the world in these terms. After all, it is only by recognizing the opposite of something that cognition is possible. If this opposite is ignored or denied, it is repressed into unconsciousness, a la the shadow. However, the consequence of this repression is that the repressed element will come roaring back, seeking horrific revenge. By repressing the history of religion with the death of God, its opposite took its revenge with the death of hundreds of millions, something that Nietzsche predicted in his book The Will to Power. By ignoring the dark element of both Jesus and God, Jung believes that Christianity will continue to decline, and its adherents will never achieve that perfection symbolized by the Jungian self. Worse yet, that repression will exacerbate the anti-Christian sentiments in the new ion. That will be the focus of the next few chapters. To conclude, it's understandable why these opposite elements remain ignored and unconscious. It's the same reason why there will be many Christians and atheists that react negatively to this video. To use the words of Edward Edinger, a famous Jungian analyst, that negative reaction indicates that the reality Jung is pointing out is so horrible that it has to be denied. In order to bring our conscious being into closer approximation to the Jungian self, we must confront the greatest hells that are within and without. Otherwise, we may lose all the benefits that reside in that dark side and suffer all of its deficits. That is what is terrifying. To quote Edinger once again, The Jungian standpoint meets my complete intellectual agreement. It is flawless so far as its logic is concerned, but emotionally, it is a horror, and I don't like it at all. And what's worse, we have 10 chapters left to go. Thank you very much for watching. If you like this video, make sure to give it a like. If you want to see more content like this, make sure to hit that subscribe button. Also, if you like the work I'm doing here and want to support me, please consider donating to my Subscribestar campaign. Depending on how much you donate, you will gain a certain number of rewards, including access to a private Minecraft server, my gamer tags, and much more. If you don't have the ability to donate, that's totally cool. Really, the best thing you can do to help me out is share this video around with a friend, on social media, wherever. Finally, if you want a more discussion surrounding Ion, make sure to subscribe to both Uberboyo and Jimmy Boyo. They provide a lot more insight into these concepts and find ways to make the subject less terrifying and much more fun. Until next time, just remember, stay yellow.